Welcome back to this third of three videos and in this one you're going to be exploring how to justify your choice of epistemology and your paradigm, especially for your master's project or maybe you're looking at this to do doctoral work as well. An exercise that's going to be well worth doing throughout this programme for you is to actually mind map so many of the uh, issues that you're thinking about, especially in relation to your project or research. So whether you're going to use a big flip chart of paper or whether you're doing it online, there are some fantastic mind mapping tools um, in Google. If you uh, uh, search for those, you can find the various tools. Because it's always worth putting a copy of this in as an appendix uh, into your work to show exactly how you've started off critically analysing the various topics that you're looking at so that you can hone in on a project that really suits you and your place of work. So when you're mind mapping, uh, there are three key elements to this. First of all, do it, explore it. So in the centre of the page, write down the particular topic that you're actually keen on studying. So whatever it is, put it down there as wide and as general as it is. But then explore m much wider out of that all the different dimensions. And this is where that word intersectionality can come in as well, because you may realise that some elements you're talking about are going to be differentiated because of people's genders, ethnicities, class, cultures, whatever. There are going to be differences for people. So be as wide as you like with this, and even if you happen to do it on more than one page. So explore that, do your mind map. And that's from your own clinical experience, and the topic that you're interested in for research, but also the more you read up on that topic, then the wider you're going to start thinking about this, and the more evidence, not just uh, professional and anecdotal evidence, but now reading up other people's works, you're going to be getting theoretical and research ideas as well that will enable you to really mind map very, very analytically here. Once you've done that, you need to take a step back from it, and that's often referred to as the helicopter view that once you stand back, you get a really good oversight of everything you've written. And even looking at this little cartoon image I've got here off the internet, um, just when you're looking at that, you may realise that your project now is going to change, that you might need to go back to the drawing board and rethink it all over again. Because it's not so much the theme that you, you wrote down in the middle of your page, but you might want to be exploring um, something that you've written elsewhere. It could be as you're looking around the whole mind map that you see that certain elements, maybe from one corner to the other, map up. Um, or you can see a few different things that you can join the dots on because you realise that there's a gap uh, between some of the things that you've written. Or also it might be a case that you just get a gut feeling. When you come across that word hypothesis... And remember, um, I keep encouraging you to check out uh, the etymology of all these different words. So think of words that you already know with hypo in, whether it's hypoglycemic, um, hypokalemic, uh, hypothermic. So hypo is below something. So a hypothesis means hypothesis, below what you've proved. The thesis is when you prove something. You do the research, you write up the thesis on it. So a hypothesis is an informed guess, an academic guess. It's a hunch that you think something's going on, but you don't know it yet. You can't prove it until you've done your research and write up your thesis on it. So that's where the word comes in. So you may be looking at your mind map and you think, well, actually, I've got a real gut feeling. There's something I haven't written down here. But as I'm looking at it, as I'm taking the helicopter view, I'm getting a gut feeling about something and that's really really important there because that may be where you now want your research to go and especially in a few slides time you'll notice I'm talking about people who are hidden or invisibilized so it could be that your gut feeling is a sort of eureka moment that you realize someone or something is missing and therefore that's now the new focus of what you want to look at. But another critical area for you to think about within healthcare is that so much healthcare research and practice is based on something called biological essentialism. And there are so many different ways in which biological essentialism just taps into different ways in which research is done. Whether that's going to be down to gender 
differences as male or female, totally excluding anybody else and their genders, but just reducing people to whether they're male or female, and then treating all females as if they're all the same, or all males as if they're all the same, um, or on ethnicities. So this in particular, biological essentialism, and it says here that it's often seen as the dominant framework for investigating humans across time and space. And hopefully what you'll be doing with your inquiry and research is actually challenging that. So although lots of stuff has been written from a biological essentialist point of view in the past, that doesn't mean that we have to keep on to this. And hopefully you'll be the ones to challenge this. So if you want to challenge it, look up stuff on social constructionism and post-structuralism. Look up those two terms and see how they apply especially social constructionism within healthcare, um, that can give you quite a challenge in looking at biological essentialism, uh, but also anything that's post-structuralist as well. Because one of the problems with biological essentialism is that it often puts people opposite to each other, a them and us mentality. And that's where you may see that if, if somebody's not with us, they're against us. There's the them and us. And that's what can create fear. And fear perpetuated um, can lead or is exacerbated by ignorance. And then that in itself can lead to hate. So especially for some of you, you may be wanting to explore the impact of different forms of hate, the different types of phobias that actually have um, a crucial role to play in healthcare service access to prevention, um, any of these things that you want to look at where you think that some people are being discriminated against, try to read back to see where that discrimination has come from. And it may be a them and us mentality uh, which is perpetuated by ignorance and leads to hate. A clear difference between biological essentialism and social constructionism is in the term that people often refer to as well, is it nature or nurture? Were you born that way or did you become that way? And um, that's, that's a really critical way of looking at things because the biological essentialism is going to be far too static for so many people in thinking, well, you've been categorised that way, that's the way you have to be. And especially your research, if you're trying to emancipate people, especially from systems that have often kept them oppressed, then you do need to explore this from lots of different angles. And maybe you might even read up some stuff on uh, your, your particular topic in relation to essentialism, but then show how it's contrasted or looked at totally differently from a constructionist point of view. But of course, we have to be really careful that we're not just saying, well, only research that's being done now today is worthy uh, for today's world, because stuff that was done in the past was unenlightened, or there were errors, or the ways in which they did it. We must learn from the past, um, and maybe it's a case that you're going to be doing some studies that are similar to what people have done in the past. But what you need to show now is how you're bringing a new epistemological lens to look at this, not just replicating what's gone in the past, but looking at it differently. And in that, then you'll use your argumentation about why it needs to be looked at differently. And in the earlier video, in the second video, when I was talking about feminism, and look at the ways in which some of the critical theories, feminism, queer theory, critical theory in itself, look at the ways in which they challenge taken for granted um, uh, positions in life. But what we mustn't do is to blame the past or blame the way that research was done just because it wasn't as good as we might hope it's going to be now today. There's another important point to consider, especially when we're talking about genders and gender identities in, in, in relation to health. Look at the ways that women's studies have really moved on uh, particularly well, especially in the world of healthcare. So you might have big hospitals that have got women's directorates, women's health services. Uh, so you might have a general hospital looking at all general issues, but there's a specific uh, uh, department or or area with, within that hospital service that's looking at women's issues. So if that's what you want to be uh, interested, if that's what you're interested in, then yes, certainly look up uh, feminist approaches to health and to health care. But don't forget about um, men's studies as well, because when you look at health, 
um, male and female genders in particular have got their own different health concerns. So there may be particular cancers that are more prone to one than the other, or some that are certainly gender specific. So uterine cancer, testicular cancer, of course these are important. But when you take a step back and look at, well, who accesses healthcare really well? Who's more likely to have more appointments with healthcare services in any particular part of their life? And you will often find that men are disadvantaged here. So if you are interested in gender uh, influences in your research, don't just look at gender from the point of view of gender theories in general or uh, feminism, but also consider the different dynamics that men's studies will bring into this as well. There's that fantastic song by Christina Aguilera when she sings It's a Man's World. And uh, I've actually played that in huge lecture halls as we've got hundreds of students coming in to study feminism. So uh, th there is this assumption that it's a man's world, but where, where health is concerned, some men are really disadvantaged here. And one of the big important things to remember is that just like with women, just like with trans people, just like with intersex people, and just like with non-binary people, not all men are the same. So it doesn't mean that you can do your research and expect every man to be identical. And that's going to be really important. Again, looking at the intersectionality. So whether it's cultures, their age ranges abilities or disabilities, look at all of these things in relation to impact on especially access to health care. Because there could be some conditions that certain men may, may be really reluctant to go and talk about. And therefore, if they're not accessing, uh, accessing proactive health care, then it may mean that they're leaving it too late. And then when treatment does come, it might be unsuccessful or they need radical uh, treatment. So here we are coming to the two key terms that we're looking at in this particular video on um, epistemology and paradigm. And remember, as I keep on saying, check these words out. Look at them at, on, on etimonline.com and then start reading much wider. Get a really good grasp of differences because even when you're writing up your methods chapter, it'll be great for you to reference a good many sources. So, in what you're seeing on the screen here, it's showing epistemology as the theory of knowledge and the assumptions and beliefs that we have about the nature of knowledge. So, it's not knowledge in itself, it's all the things pertaining to and building up and before that. Whereas a paradigm is more to do with a model or a framework. That's the particular uh, genre of research you're doing. And it may be that you're, you're following... Um, um, a positivist approach, a post-positivist approach, or you may be taking more uh, critical studies and using qualitative research. But the paradigm is the model or the framework that will actually come out of your epistemology. It'll come out of your worldview, and that's then what you then go on to develop um, by choosing which methods you're going to use to operationalize, to enflesh all of this uh, theoretical part of your work. So here's an overview of three key ways that you can justify your choice of epistemology and paradigm. The first one, and think back to what you would have done with your mind mapping exercise, the first one is, is trying to encourage you to listen to oppressed or invisibilized voices. So who, who are the people that don't usually show up in research studies? Who are the people you feel are missing from your service. So whatever type of study you're hoping to do, is it just a study on the people that do turn up there, or are you interested in those who don't turn up? And if you're interested in those who don't turn up, then ask yourselves why. Why is it that they're disenfranchised, they're not engaging, maybe they're the people that regularly don't attend for appointments. So listen to the voices of the oppressed or the invisibilized people. And you would have seen in um, uh, video two, when I was talking about a, um, a research or an epistemic bricolage. So use different epistemies, different ways of thinking about this, and that'll give you much more authentic fairness rather than just following one route. So if you just picked up books and journal articles about one, uh, one particular type 
of epistemy, you're going to be very blinkered in that view there. You do need to challenge yourself and to think about this differently. So listen to other voices as well. And if you're going to draw this together, an eclectic synthesis, as I demonstrated in uh, video two, so your, your epistemic uh, bricolage, you're bringing it together in a very, very unique way in relation to the studies that you're doing. And one of the things that you will be doing there is to challenge the paradox of power. And by challenging power, it's a case of, well, normally we have all these people turning up at our clinic. And maybe it's power that's maintaining those. And the people who aren't accessing your services may be feeling totally disempowered. So this is going to enable you to challenge any forms of power. And usually the forms of power may be quite hidden. And that in itself is leading back to your first goal here of listening to marginalised or invisibilised and hidden voices. So the three ways to justify this, let me just read some of this, that um, Anderson and McCann in 2002 said that it's transformative knowledge which will be produced by research that analyses the complex factors that shape healthcare learning and policy, paying particular attention to liberating the voices that are traditionally marginalised. Okay, So your research could end up being transformative because it's going to be touching people who aren't normally touched. Okay, It's transformative that way. And Clegg in 1999 referred to a systematic critique of oppression. And that's what your research can do as well. You can try to look out for those hidden, the marginalised voices and critique the, the forms of power and domination, the hegemony, that's actually keeping them oppressed. And this one's just saying that rather than sticking to that one school of thought, as I've just encouraged you to do, think of others as well. So if, if you're looking at a project to do with access to health care, and you might think, well, I just need to count the number of people coming in. But then you realise, well, there are more from one age group than another. Or lots of people with full abilities as opposed to people with disabilities. So then you might focus your project on looking at why is it people with disabilities find it awkward to access our services? Or how come we don't get people from particular cultures coming to us? Let me give you a really good example here. If you're talking about postnatal depression, supposing you wanted to do a project on that, well, there are people from some ethnicities and some cultures that don't even have the word depression in their vocabulary. And when it comes to postnatal depression, you may be a health visitor and you're going around and you've got the Edinburgh postnatal depression scale and you want to fill that in. And you're asking for questions about depression and the person may be saying to you, no, I haven't got depression because maybe they don't even understand what the word means. And yet when they talk to you about how they're feeling or maybe they say, look, I sit down and cry all day long and I don't know where my tears are coming from. So there's the signs of depression without them having the words to be able to say it. So when you're looking at um, uh, ways of exploring these things, even look at post-colonial studies, ethnicity studies, ethnographies. All these different things will give you a whole different insight into the particular topic area that you're looking at. And especially when you're um, using different ways of thinking, you, you will keep getting those eureka moments. Oh, blimey, I didn't think of that before. And that's what your studies are going to be on about now. Trying to discover what people don't routinely talk about because they're not listening to all the voices that you have got the potential to listen to. And the third and final point, point here, if you're looking at emancipatory epistemologies, so those epistemologies that look at throwing off the shackles of power for people, giving people power to have a voice. Another good example here, look at the way that victims of sexual or domestic violence are often referred to as victims. And then you might find that there are some organisations which are called um, survivors organisations. So that's taking a shift, um, a, an epistemic paradigm, a real shift here in thinking from being a victim into being a survivor. 
But there's somebody called Emily Coulter Thompson, and she says there's a stage further from that even. Move from victim through survivor to thriver. Now, even if you start looking at, well, what does it feel like to be in each of those positions? That's the ontological um, dimension that you're looking at then. What's the ontology of being a victim or the ontology of being a, a survivor moving on to the ontology of being a thriver? So if you're looking at emancipatory epistemologies, they're going to help you to throw off the shackles of society's usual approach to power, this hegemonic logic which keeps people um, hidden. And whether that's on their gender, uh, ethnicities, abilities, whatever you're looking at, this form of power normally raises some people up, but what it does to the other is it shrouds them, as Foucault would say, with non-existence, non-manifestation, and keeps them silent. So if people can't even talk about their issues, then maybe nobody's even going to do research on it because nobody thinks there's anything to, to research in the first place. Okay, so when you look at emancipating people, that's what you're going to be doing here. Lastly, a few other things to say on power. That by highlighting um, the issues of power, and especially the ways in which it silences people, takes a voice away from them, you will actually be able to uh, question and critique that, but also in doing so, give people power, and therefore that's emancipation. So it could be that the type of research that you're looking at is to do with um, your particular service area, and you want to find out what are the usual trappings of power within this area. So it may be a case of, well, are some health professionals treated differently to others? Is it a case that when a patient or a client goes in to see one health professional, they may tell them certain things, and when they go to another one, it may be totally different. So then you might say, well, you're interested in the power dynamics in different professional roles. But whatever you're doing, when you're doing that, you are challenging the trappings of power. Because even going in as a researcher, people will automatically think, well, if you're researching something, you might be qu you must be quite an intellectual person. You're advanced, maybe you're career motivated. So they're making assumptions about you straight away. And especially if they don't feel that they can map up to you or match up to you, then there's another power differential going on. So what you're looking at here is looking at ways of throwing off the trappings of power to be able to emancipate other people and giving them power within their own lives. So you're not trying to create a whole new research um, awareness or research paradigm or even a healthcare service of your own. You're not trying to create something, oh, I'm the first one to think of this and that's what I'm going to do. It's not that at all. But what you're doing is, is looking at traditional services, whether it's in health or social care, looking at how things are normally done, but challenging those, querying them to understand them totally differently, to see if there is something that means that because of the power in the system, some people are completely disenfranchised. Now, when it comes to people, um, say for example, somebody with a disability who needs disability allowance, look at the ways in which so many people are completely frightened or put off of exploring the documentation from the Department for Work and Pension. Look how the DWP may be sending out assessment forms that are almost 30 pages long. Now, what people are not going to be able to access those? And it's not just down to um, language as in uh, uh, different languages, not, not being able to speak English. Even if they can access them in their own language, there may still be problems of understanding and misunderstanding. And therefore, some people will think, well, I just won't fill the form in. Or if they do fill it in, they don't fill it in well enough for them to get everything they're entitled to. Therefore, there's disadvantage going on, people are being marginalised, and lots of people are missing out on, what, on the services that they really need. So that's how your research can actually help and empower them. 
Okay, and I think it, it was me who said this. I've tried Googling it and I can't find a reference to it. So maybe I said this in my own doctoral thesis, that it's essential for us to be grounded in theoretical perspectives. So epistemologies and ontologies, because any research without that is just a skilled technology. Okay, and that's the end of this presentation. Please, once you've listened to it, get back to me on Moodle so we can share our learning with each other. So go into the specific forum for this week and then start sharing your knowledge and your ideas with us. And especially when it comes to us thinking about your projects, you can start thrashing this out more and more and more. And when you do those exercises, like the uh, mind mapping and the helicopter view, it means you then go back to the drawing board, because you might, might now be looking at totally different aspects, especially when it comes to the trappings of power and privilege, and trying to overturn that, to listen to those voices that are traditionally hidden, marginalised or invisibilised. Thanks for listening.